Hello, and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Victoria J. Hanneman, Associate Professor at Creighton University School of Law. We will discuss her article, Intergenerational Equity, Student Loan Debt, and Taxing Dead Rich People, which will be published in the Virginia Tax Review. So welcome to the show, Victoria. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. So, <laughs> well, it's great to have you on. Um, and I must say, I, I really enjoyed reading your paper, especially the introduction, which was just a, a funny, fun setup for for a paper that was a little unexpected. Like I wasn't, you know, it 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 it, it, it wasn't pitched in the way that I initially thought it would be. And I really enjoyed it. Oh, well, thank you. I wanted to open it in, I wanted to open the article in a less traditional way. I, I mean, I could say that I think that the impact of using student loans as sort of the primary way that we finance higher education has this laundry list of problems, but I wanted to draw the reader in um, with sort of a different intro. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's a big part of your paper is sort of premised on these concerns about intergenerational equity. And one of the things I liked about the introduction was that it made that problem much more concrete, uh, almost through the kind of wry humor of the introduction. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about sort of intergenerational equity, what that means, and why you think it's an issue. I think that what we do today has a butterfly effect on future generations. And I don't know that we necessarily, as lawyers, in creating and shaping policy, um, I don't know that we necessarily think about that enough, but in the context of higher education, we are making decisions about financing higher education that overlaps generations. And we're soon going to see the consequences of our decisions hitting retirement savings and the housing market and next generation college savings. Um, right now, we are, I think, passing a burden on to later generations. And I think that we need to start thinking about higher education finance in the context of the bill that we're passing on or the can that we are kicking down the road. Mm. So it seems like this intergenerational equity issue comes up in kind of a broad range of spectrum or a broad range of, of policy areas, uh, especially in relation to the sort of respective interests of the kind of boomer, baby boomer generation writ large and the younger millennial, you know, Gen Z or whatever, like later younger generations. Um, why do you think it is that higher education financing is such a kind of flashpoint or is sort of epitomizes this intergenerational equity? I issue? think that there are other areas that epitomize it as well. I think that um, the social security problem that we are facing, the Medicare problem that we are facing in terms of a lack of funding, I think that that will soon be coming at us. Student loan debt is really focused on by the media, however. And so I do think that this is an issue in several different policy areas. I started writing about student loan debt in 2012, and when I started writing about student loan debt, um, there was a panic in the media about the fact that we were approaching a trillion dollars of outstanding student loan debt. We are not even a decade later and we're staring down two trillion dollars with no significant progress having been made. 
Mm, mm. I mean, is that at kind of what rate is that amount of student loan debt outstanding growing? Has it been a relatively kind of steady linear growth or it's is increasing. it increasing? I have modeled out projections and my prog- my projections are that within the next 30 years student loan debt will exceed 13 trillion dollars if it continues at current rate of speed um and, and of course there are issues that that correlate to the increase in borrowing which would be the increase in tuition and I do discuss that in the paper. I mean, you can't discuss one without discussing the other. Um, It's interesting because the focus on student loan debt has, in the media, has it's really come sharply in focus with the Democratic presidential candidates. I I mean, I, I wonder if you could talk then about sort of what's led to this this change in how we go go about funding higher higher education i mean is 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 the problem that there's a rising cost associated with higher education that we've sort of shifted to emphasizing borrowing rather than other forms of funding or is it kind of a more of like a synergy of the two or a perfect storm of like different factors all pushing in the same direction? So historically, historically, we have supported higher education through a combination of grants, debt, and tax subsidies. And we also have had a significant state and federal investment into higher education directly. Um, What we see over the past 30 years is a state divestment from higher education, which is a really extremely important policy shift. We see state funding for higher education substantially below 2008 levels. State support of higher ed has been extremely elastic, and when budget cuts are needed, you see those budget cuts frequently happening with post-secondary educational institutions. One study says that 45 out of 49 states spent less per student in 2018 than 2008. Nine of those states have reduced their funding by 30% over the past 10 years. We know that 2017 is the first year that these institutions are relying more on tuition than on state support. And that, of course, is causing upward pressure on tuition. I mean, a staggering level of upward pressure on tuition. We have liquidity from student loans. Student loans are available um, almost without limit. And so there's no incentive for administrators to keep costs down. We know that there's sort of a vicious cycle of cause and effect that we've created as states are forced to cut their funding administrators are raising tuition and fees, and students are having to borrow more in student loan debt. I mean, overall, there's kind of been a shift in ideology, right, which is that we're just making less of an investment into higher education. We see a, we see a drop internationally. If we look at the OECD charts, The U.S. has dropped to 14th of 28 with regard to the number of 25 to 34-year-olds who are completing a university education. I mean, interestingly enough, we were number one. We were number one for the age range that's 55 to 64 right now, which just happens to be the baby boomer generation. Mm -hmm. Well, in a way, it seems like that represents sort of a version of the intergenerational inequity that you're talking about in the sense that the very generation that benefited from public investment 
in their education is now asking essentially their own children to shoulder the entire burden themselves through debt rather than through public investment. I I completely agree. And I think that we hear people saying, get a job and work hard and pay off your student loan debt because I did. But the fact is, tuition costs simply were not at the levels back then that they are now. It's not realistic to say, oh, get a job, pay off your student loan debt. I mean, are there students doing it? Unquestionably, there are. But we also have no studies really considering the long-term impacts of the higher education finance policy. We don't know about the long-term impacts on marriage and family and racial wealth inequality. We do know that, I mean, I the paper to a certain extent, the causes a very visceral reaction um, from, I assume, baby boomers who don't like to feel blamed by the problem at hand. I don't know that I'm necessarily assigning blame in the sense of moral blame so much as assigning blame saying, here is what we are at as a result of the choices that have been made by those who were in charge as a generation um as a generation they looked at sort of two binary choices available to them there was market freedom or state involvement and they decided to carve a third path which is financing through debt i i think that we now see a rise in politicians like elizabeth warren and bernie sanders who've accepted that the choices are binary and that this path cutting between the two is not working, that we need to see more state involvement to meet basic needs, such as post-secondary education. I am not, I'm not at all, by the way, complimenting or commenting on the policies that they are coming up with. I'm just suggesting that millennials are, are very much embracing their viewpoints. And it's interesting that the choice of the baby boomer generation was to cut a path that avoided this binary choice. We know that um, leaving student loan debt financing to the marketplace creates equity issues. And so we have state involvement, but I would say we have state involvement sort of by managing the student loan debt program. Mm-hmm. Well, and to kind of underscore the generational equity issue, I mean, you do point to several kind of macro policy changes that were effectively driven by kind of boomer generation voters that sort of came, were part and parcel with the, you know, the kind of shift in the way we finance higher education and sort of, it seems to me like a shift in the way we think about financing government more more generally. I wonder if you could just kind of put a finger on some of those changes and sort of how those kind of policy decisions shifted uh, shifted equity or you know kind of shifted financial benefits to boomers at the expense of later generations. So we start seeing. We start seeing the boomers coming into control of the electorate by 1982 and official control of the government by 1990. Of course, we have our first boomer president with Bill Clinton in 1993, and the boomers still do control the House and the Senate today. We have under boomer control, no comprehensive budget being passed on time since 1994. We now have more than 20 registered lobbyists for every member of Congress. We have the use of temporary effect legislation to circumvent budget rules that's become extremely commonplace over the last two decades. 
social security costs that are going to exceed revenue by 2021 and backup funds that are projected to be depleted by 2034. Medicaid funds that will be exhausted by 2029. And this is, I think, most important. We have a, a deficit of $22 trillion, which is the highest that it has ever been. We've run a deficit since 2001. And that deficit now exceeds the GDP for the first time in history. Student loan debts tripled over the past 14 years, and we're projecting that it's going to grow about $30 billion per fiscal quarter. Now, against the backdrop of all of this, the boomer generation, they've positioned themselves as the wealthiest generation in the history of the world. And they're going to remain that way until at least 2030. They are paying lower effective and marginal tax rates than their parents were. There's been a recent reduction in corporate tax, of course, through TCJA. They are receiving lower tax rates on dividend income. And now when we are stepping on the precipice of them passing away, they've gutted the estate and gift tax in 2018, by raising the lifetime exclusion to $11.4 million. Yeah, so basically it's like they're making decisions that collectively benefit them and their generation at the, at the expense of the ability of the government to reapportion or redistribute to people at the beginning of their career, the when, when the government was in fact benefiting boomers. That, that is the argument that I am making in the paper. It, it is interesting to me teaching in a red state for the past several years. Um, there is an antipathy towards the estate and gift tax. I think that the propaganda against the estate and gift tax with labeling it a death tax has been extremely effective. The fact is most taxpayers are not going to be impacted by the estate and gift tax, whether it's under current law or it is under the pre-2018 change. And yet the vast majority of taxpayers loathe or they, they think the estate and gift tax is unfair. Now, it, it does seem to cross both parties that taxpayers just do not like the estate and gift tax, which has been rebranded to them as a death tax. It is interesting, though, when I speak with people and I suggest that we earmark revenue from the estate and gift tax to address higher education, um, when I suggest that across Across both parties, at least with the folks I have spoken to anecdotally, people really embrace it. Before we talk uh, directly about the sort of modifications to the estate tax that you propose and why you think that that would be uh, a effective way to help mitigate some of these problems, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the concept of debt as a common pool resource. So what does that mean? And why do you think that's a helpful way to understand specifically the problems that we're seeing uh, around debt in the higher education context? Oh, that's a great question. Common pool research, or common pool resource research talks about or, or addresses the concept of a resource system that is large enough to make it costly or impossible to exclude people from obtaining benefits of its use. So examples would be, or examples that have been discussed in scholarship would include clean water, um, grazing systems. If you think about the tragedy of the commons example that we are all familiar with, urban commons, you do see some really interesting interdisciplinary research recently that applies CPR analysis to things such as surfers' waves 
or campus commons, public parking, and the internet. Um, we have recently seen some researchers talking about common pool resource theory applying to government finance. And the reason why I'm looking at this CPR theory as a foundation of analysis is because it, it offers a framework by which we can define a public good and call for cooperation with regard to the management of the common good. We, we were directly responsible for about a third of student loans with the rest of the loans being federally guaranteed, but not directly from our government until a 2010 change when all federally guaranteed loans are now coming directly from our government. And I believe with that change that this debt falls squarely within this definition of a common pool resource. We have an openness to student loan debt, meaning we really don't restrict accessibility. And we have a tragedy of the commons problem potentially facing us. If we don't put cooperative management rules or we don't impose a cooperative management system on the use of this debt, to sort of optimize its use, it's just going to continue to grow unfettered, which is what we have seen. We don't actually know what the capacity is with regard to student loan debt because there are too many, there's too many uncertainties. We don't know what the capacity is when we hit overexploitation. But I believe, at least as a research in this researcher in this area, that Overexploitation absolutely can occur. You look to the estate and gift tax as a tool that we could, a policy tool that could be used to mitigate this problem and sort of re redistribute, in a sense, as it were, to make money available for the government to invest in younger people rather than leaving it in the hands of of older people. So why do you think that's a, a, a useful tool and, and how might that work in practice? So there are two facets to this. The first facet is how are we going to redesign the system? And the second is how are we going to pay for the redesign? And I think a comprehensive discussion of either is a book, or at least that's the conclusion I've come to, because I started out doing this as one paper, and now I've carved it into two papers, and I actually think it's three papers and a book. I mean, this is sort of a discussion that is so large that it is hard to um, corral it into one or two papers. I look at a state and gift tax and broadening the estate and gift tax as one important part of how we finance change. I don't know that it is a, or, or rather I'm fairly certain it is not a comprehensive funding solution. I think that we've really had this ideology of lowering taxes, of constantly lowering taxes and, we really need to make an investment into higher education if this is important to us. I think that broadening the estate and gift tax to, um, to I think that broadening estate and gift tax is, is one of the first ways that we can approach that reinvestment. Now, with regard to broadening the estate and gift tax, it's really not that complicated. You have three facets of this. You reduce the lifetime exclusion amount, um, you raise rates, and you close loopholes. 
And you do see the presidential candidate to talk about, you know, tweaking the estate and gift tax. You do see the presidential candidates with their own version um with their own version of tweaking the system, but all of the versions that you're seeing from the presidential candidates involve these three elements, changing rates, changing exemption amounts, and and closing loopholes. Well, so Victoria, in closing, I know this is going to be a little speculative, but as you've noted several times, like these are increasingly problems that people are recognizing and ideas uh, about sort of how to potentially solve them t- seem to be floating around uh, kind of socially generally, but specifically in relation to the upcoming election. And I just wonder from your experience, how do you think these issues are likely to affect decision-making in the upcoming election, specifically sort of like to the extent that sort of the estate tax has a bad name among boomers, although as you say, maybe, you know, framed in the right way, the reaction isn't quite so negative. Um, But also the sort of the history of the boomer generation sort of de-emphasizing investment in education and emphasizing kind of the shifting of tax burdens to, to benefit as broad a class of their generation as, as possible. I mean, do you think that those are going to be salient factors for voters in kind of deciding what they want to do in the upcoming election? Or do you think the center of gravity might start to shift more to younger voters who might be more open to, to some of these changes and maybe more open or kind of to, to, to find the problems, ones that they personally experience and therefore understand that need to be addressed? I believe the center of gravity is not going to shift to the younger voters for another five to 10 years. And so I don't know how impactful these issues are going to be for the next election. I do think that some of our candidates are really trying to speak to the younger voters, but I don't know that you're going to see that shift happen for five to 10 years. I would like to call upon this administration to improve data collection so that we can really meaningfully study the system that we do currently have. Well, that's, that's, yeah, no, that, 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 that makes a lot of sense to me. And, and I want to thank you, Victoria. It's been really fun talking to you about your paper and, um, I enjoyed reading it and I encourage, I encourage listeners to check it out because there's a lot more detail in there that we weren't able to cover in the interview. Thank you so much, Brian. student now goes to college to proclaim rather than to learn. The lessons of the past are ignored and obliterated in a contemporary antagonism known as the generation gap. A spirit of national masochism prevails, encouraged by an effete core of impudent snobs who characterize themselves as intellectuals. A law-abiding American who believes in his country needs a strong voice to articulate his dissatisfaction with those who seek to destroy our heritage of liberty and our system of justice. To penetrate the cacophony of seditious drivel emanating from the best publicized clowns in our society and their fans in the fourth estate.